Australia's military history is filled with stories of service and sacrifice of those who have chosen to wear the uniform of their country of birth or adoption and the legacies and values they've created. So what happens when someone falls short of these ideals? Welcome to From Duty to Dishonor, a Doc Network podcast. Let's get started. As Private Stafford, absent without leave from the battalion, was recognised again in Charleroi, it was decided to attempt his capture. This man has entries of crimes covering both sides of three conduct sheets since 1915 and with the peculiar distinction of never having been in the frontline trenches. Two battalion officers, Lieutenant R.R. Shanks and 2nd Lieutenant H.W. Mott, proceeded to Charleroi in the evening. They wore no officer distinctions and had no colour patches but each carried a loaded revolver and a pass from the CO with orders to effect the capture of Private Stafford, dead or alive. These officers commenced the search at 7.30pm and found the missing man in a disreputable brothel of the town. In typical Wild West style, they held up the entire dancing saloon. Lieutenant Shanks grappled with the prisoner and threw him to the ground, while Lieutenant Mott covered the prisoner and the habitues of the saloon with two revolvers. During the scuffle on the floor, Private Stafford attempted to draw a revolver. He was immediately shot by Lieutenant Mott. Stafford's dying words were, quote, you bastard, unquote, which may be regarded as his own epitaph to one of the most criminal lives of a soldier in the Australian Imperial Force. Great commendation is due to Lieutenant Shanks and Lieutenant Mott for their resource and gameness, and undeniable credit to the battalion for the original and effective means of capturing and terminating the career of a man who brought discredit to the honourable record of the 48th Battalion. Percy George Landers Stafford was born on approximately January 1894 to William James and Catherine Stafford in the Castlereagh district of the New South Wales colony near Penrith. Stafford was the second youngest of four children and the third son to the couple. Nothing is really known about Stafford's early life or his family situation, save for that at the outbreak of the First World War, Stafford had travelled to Queensland either with or following his father and was working as a station hand when he enlisted on the 10th of May 1915. He had previously attempted to enlist in the Australian Imperial Force but had been rejected on account of having an ingrown toenail. He did list his father his next of kin and his father's profession as a horsebreaker at an unknown address but sadly Stafford seemed to be unaware that his father had already passed away on the 29th of May 1913. Percy Stafford volunteered for overseas service in Brisbane and was accepted into the 11th Reinforcements for the 2nd Light Horse Regiment. After a period of training in Australia, he departed for overseas service on the 4th of October aboard the transport ship HMAT A47 Mashrobra. And in January 1916, he was taken on strength for the 1st Light Horse Reserve Regiment and was briefly hospitalised with a mild case of dysentery. After spending five days in hospital, he returned to the unit. In February, while in the reserve regiment, he was found guilty of disobeying orders and two instances of being absent from parade and was fined £10 as well as forfeiting one day's pay, which isn't really a great start to his career. On the 1st of March, he'd be taken on strength with the 1st Light Horse Regiment in Heliopolis. Three months after Stafford's arrival in Heliopolis, his oldest brother, William Alexander Stafford, who at the time was working with the New South Wales Government Railways in Bathurst, enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force on the 6th of March as part of the 3rd Light Rail Operating Company, and enlisted his brother Harry, who had been living in Harden, as his next of kin. Almost from the beginning, Stafford's military career was fraught with difficulties. After completing initial training and deployment, he, by all appearances, struggled to adapt to the rigours of military life, and his service record is reflective of someone who potentially had been swept up in the pomp and ceremony of defending King Country in the realm, and then discovered to his horror that it wasn't exactly what had been described in the brochure. On the very day he was taken on strength, the 1st Light Horse Regiment, as part of the Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, Stafford was reported absent from parade and from guard, and as a result forfeited one day pay. While this was happening, portions of the 1st Light Horse Regiment had been sent to guard parts of the Nile and Suez Canal from Senussi tribesmen. Following the Gallipoli Campaign, much like the infantry component of the Australian Imperial Force and the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, the Australian Light Horse Regiment and the New Zealand Mounted Rifles underwent a period of expansion, which resulted in the formation of the Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division, which comprised of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th Light Horse Brigades and the New Zealand Mounted Rifle Brigade. At the end of March, Stafford was again absent without leave on two separate occasions, and as a result was confined to barracks for 14 days. 
Not to be outdone while carrying out that punishment, he'd also be absent from defaulters parade on the 1st of April, and as a result, was punished an additional 14 days confined to barracks. Defaulters parade is a kind of punishment where those convicted of an offence had to present themselves to the guard on duty in full kit, generally at the start and end of the working day, which in civilian times would usually be about 0600 to 1600 hours respectively. After completing this punishment, he returned to the Suez Canal and his unit on the 28th of April. Stafford would go absent without leave again on the 13th, 15th of May and was awarded 21 days field punishment number two and forfeited three days pay. Field punishment number two meant that he was either handcuffed or placed in leg irons, but was still able to march and drill with the unit. This differed from field punishment number one, where the accused would be chained to a post or a wheel or some other static object for the duration of the sentence and often in the crucifixion pose. While undertaking this punishment, he somehow managed to go AWL for one day and as a result was awarded another seven days, field punishment number two, and forfeited another two days pay. At the start of June, Stafford would be charged with that escape and because of a field general court-martial in July, he was sentenced to six months hard labour and to be dismissed from His Majesty's service. Unfortunately, even though that sentence had been signed off on and would, by all accounts, solve everyone's problems, there was a slight catch to it. And as a result, the Commander-in-Chief, Egyptian Expeditionary Force, General Archibald James Murray, ruled on the 12th of July, 1916, that the sentence of dismissal was, quote, inoperative. There is no such sentence under the Army Act in the case of a regular soldier, unquote. At the time, Stafford was incarcerated at the detention barracks in Abbasia until the 24th of August, 1916. After that, he was transferred to the Citadel in Cairo on the 7th of September. When he had the remainder of his sentence suspended on the 7th of October, he was released two days later and we were taken on strength with the 1st Light Horse Training Regiment from detention and from there he would be taken on strength with the 2nd Light Horse Regiment at Kantara on the 28th of October. His new commanding officer was a lot harsher on him than his predecessor in the 1st Light Horse Regiment as on the 26th of November at Bir El Amasi, he was charged with neglect of duty in that he failed to remove all the nose feed bags and allowed a horse to stray from the line and was awarded four days field punishment number two. The middle of December would see him charged with conduct to the prejudice of good order and military discipline in that he was late to parade and was awarded another week of field punishment number two with the forfeiture of pay. The new year would see the 2nd Light Horse and Stafford in camp near El Arish for most of January until they participated in the Battle of Rafa on the 9th. This battle marked the final battle to complete the recapture of the Sinai Peninsula by British forces. During the battle, the Desert Column attacked an entrenched Ottoman army garrison at the village of El Maguntain near Rafa on the coastward side of the Sinai-Palestine border, resulting in a British victory that was, while successful, beset with issues. Spurred on by the successes at Romani and Magdaba, British forces continued their advance eastward, supported by newly constructed railway and water pipelines that connected Cairo to El Arish. General Sir Archibald Murray, commander of the EEF, ordered an attack on Rafa to pressure Ottoman forces to abandon the desert bases and outposts. The Desert Column, commanded by British officer Lieutenant General Philip Chetwood, initiated the attack despite challenges such as ammunition shortages and enemy reinforcements from Khan Yunus and Shalal. The assault involved the Anzac Mounted Division, the Imperial Camel Corps Brigade, Mounted Yeomanry Divisions, armoured cars and other units surrounding the Ottoman garrison, eventually capturing key redoubts after intense fighting. Despite those ammunition shortages and stubborn Ottoman defences, the Allied forces were eventually successful, but it was still a costly victory for Allied casualties included 71 killed and 415 wounded, while Ottoman losses totaled around 200 killed and over 1,400 prisoners. Following the battle, while a rearguard garrison of two light horse regiments remained to screen the field ambulance units who were collecting the wounded, Stafford and the rest of the British forces retired to Sheikh Zawaid for water and rations. February would see the unit relocated to El Risa, where between training and a board of inquiry into the raid at Rafa, the unit would occupy the outpost line every three days from the beginning of February before the unit moved to camp once more at El Mazar, where they conducted patrols encountering no Ottoman forces. In March, Stafford found himself thrust back into combat during the First Battle of Gaza, a crucial juncture following his involvement in line of communication patrols and training exercises between El Mazar and El Marish at the start of the month. Under the command of Infantry General Lieutenant General Charles McPherson Doble, commander of the Eastern Force, Allied forces set their sights on capturing Gaza as the strategic precursor to the larger objective of seizing the Holy City of Jerusalem. 
Under Nobel's command was the Desert Column, the formidable assembly comprising of three infantry divisions, two mounted divisions, a camel brigade, a mounted yeomanry division, and supported by artillery support, armoured cars, and aircraft from No. 14 Squadron Royal Flying Corps and No. 1 Squadron Australian Flying Corps. On the 25th of March, the Anzac Mounted Division, in conjunction with the Imperial Mounted Division, executed a tactical encirclement of Gaza to sever its access to reinforcements. As the battle unfolded the following day, amid dense fog, the mounted troops enveloped the city, effectively isolating it from external support. However, initial progress by the infantry was hampered by Ottoman resistance, prompting General Philip Chetwood, the commander of the Desert Column, to order the mounted divisions to stand ready to reinforce the infantry offensive. Under the leadership of Australian General Henry Chevelle, the Anzac Mounted Division launched a decisive assault from the north at 3pm. At dusk, the mounted troops had breached Gaza's defences, but apprehensions regarding imminent Ottoman reinforcements prompted a cautious directive, withdraw if Gaza remained uncaptured by nightfall. This decision perplexed many, including the Anzac Mounted Division and the infantry commanders in the field, who believed victory was within their grasp if they just had a bit more time. Despite this frustration, the divisions dutifully adhere to orders, executing a disciplined withdrawal and regrouping with other forces after midnight. While British commanders lauded the battle as a triumph, the failure to capture Gaza elicited differing interpretations in the media. Ottoman sources underscored their resilience in the face of British claims of victory by reminding them that their primary objective remained in Ottoman hands. It was only well after the dust had settled that the British commanders realised just how badly they had blundered. Despite British authorities claiming success, the official Australian historian Charles Bean had a different view, one held by contemporary historians. Quote, In itself, the engagement was a severe blow to the British Army, since it affected the troops on both sides to a degree out of all proportion to the casualties suffered, or to the negative victory gained by the Turks. There is not a single private in the British infantry or a trooper in the mounted brigades who did not believe the failure was due to staff bungling and nothing else, unquote. Despite the media attention, the British War Officer's order still stood. Gaza had to be taken, and three weeks later, the Eastern Force would attempt the Second Battle of Gaza on the 17th of April. The Second Battle of Gaza lasted three days and comprised a frontal assault by infantry supported by two tanks and the Anzac and Imperial Mounted Divisions guarding the right flank towards Beersheba. While the infantry were focused on capturing Gaza, the mounted forces were tasked with advancing along the right flank, capturing the redoubts at Herara, Antoine, and Herpin. Despite the infantry brigades succeeding in entering the Ottoman trenches at several points, they were weakened by the fierce defence to retain these gains through strong counterattacks. While the mounted troops were able to take most of their objectives, even surviving an Ottoman countercharge by cavalry, inadequate coordination between the mounted troops and the infantry, logistical challenges and the Ottoman resistance meant on the night of the 19th, the battle ended with British troops once again unable to capture Gaza, resulting in another stalemate. This second victory bolstered Ottoman morale and resulted in Generals Dobell and Murray being sent back to England in disgrace as another stalemate on the First World War would now exist for the next six months and would only end with the Battle of Beersheba in October 1917. On the 27th of April, Stafford was admitted to a hospital at Shalale, sick before he was admitted in sequence to the 54th Casualty Clearing Station, the 26th Casualty Clearing Station and finally the number 14 Australian General Hospital in Cairo on the 29th of April with an anal fistula. On the 16th of May, he was transferred to the convalescent depot. While he was recovering, he once again went AWL for two days, when he overstayed a leave pass and was apprehended by military police. As a result, he forfeited two days' pay and fined an additional 14 on the 7th of June. Stafford was discharged from the convalescent depot in Abbasia in Cairo, and the following day returned to the Light Horse Training Regiment. Nine days later, he was AWL for four days from the 16th of June to the 20th and with two counts of being out of bounds. At this point, it had been the longest he had been AWL. As a result, he was awarded 10 days field punishment number two and deferred five days pay while he awaited trial, the aftermath of which was a forfeiture of another five days pay. On the 25th of June, he was marched into the field punishment compound and after carrying out this punishment, he returned to the 2nd Light Horse Regiment on the 4th of July at El Gamli while the unit was conducting reconnaissance missions out of camp there, probing Ottoman forces to the north, east and south as part of the EEF's renewed push into southern Palestine. August would see Stafford and the rest of the regiment conducting support operations of the larger EEF laying communications cable and conducting further patrols until the 28th of August, when his fistula had once again caused him troubles and he was admitted to a hospital in Marrakeb, before being transferred to the 1st Light Horse Field Ambulance on the 28th of August. 
He was transferred to the 74th Casualty Clearing Station and then the 24th Stationary Hospital. From there, it was trained to Cairo and once again admitted to the 14th Australian General Hospital on the 31st of August. While there, he was charged with being absent for an hour and a half and as a result was fined three days pay. He was discharged from the 14th Australian General Hospital to the Moascar Training Camp where he returned to the 2nd Light Horse Regiment the following day while they were at the Kilo 10 Camp undergoing further training. In October, the unit moved to El Fukari in southern Palestine and then on to Rafa. At the end of October, the 2nd Light Horse will then move once more in support of the advance around El Hathina and Kalasa to the southwest as the Desert Mountain Corps headed for Beersheba. On the 5th of November 1917, Stafford was awarded 168 hours punishment for the charged conduct and the prejudice of good order and military discipline in, quote, that he at Moascar on the afternoon of 5th November did not rejoin the party after being given permission to go to the latrines, unquote. And after that week of punishment, he rejoined the regiment as they advanced towards Ramleh, having captured El Mugar while he was in detention. By the 15th, the 1st Light Horse Brigade, that the 2nd Light Horse Regiment was assigned to, reached Ramleh, and in Stafford's absence, Gaza would finally fall to British forces following the defeat of Ottoman and German forces during the Third Battle of Gaza at the end of October. The newly arrived Commander-in-Chief, General Sir Edmund Allenby, who'd recently come to Egypt after losing the confidence of British Commander-in-Chief Field Marshal Douglas Haig, following the disastrous Battle of Arras in the spring, aimed to capitalise on the collapse of Ottoman forces and to finally achieve the ultimate objective, the capture of Jerusalem. As a result, Stafford, with the rest of the 2nd Light Horse Regiment, would be involved in the rapid southern Palestine offensive. This renewed offensive was off the back of a comment made by British Prime Minister David Lloyd George that in light of flagging morale at home due to the ongoing standout in Europe, that the holy city of Jerusalem should be captured by Christmas as a gift to the British people. Although Australian forces played a supporting role in the initial advance on Jerusalem, they performed crucial tasks to the left or coastal flank of the advance. They cleared Ottoman positions, disrupted vital rail and communication centres, and secured sources of fresh water. Their efforts began at the position known as Junction Station, where the railway line connecting Jaffa and Jerusalem intersected with the main Turkish rail line to southern Palestine. Stafford and the rest of the 2nd Light Horse, along with the now-expanded Australian and Anzac Mounted Divisions, participated in the battles of Mugar Ridge and nearby Sawmill, securing the groundwork for the next objective of the Expeditionary Force, the Holy City itself, which was attacked on the 17th of November. Their first task was securing the heights on either side of the Jaffa to Jerusalem Road at Amwas. This fell to the Australian Mounted Division, with the 2nd Light Horse Regiment attached. The capture was swift and the division withdrew to a rest camp. Ultimately, British forces would seize Jerusalem by the end of December, though Stafford would not be around to see this victory as on the 8th of December, either due to his fistula or due to the ongoing bouts of going AWL, Stafford was transferred to the infantry and sent to Alexandria for embarkation to England aboard the troop ship HT Voluma. On his arrival in England, things took a major turn in Stafford's conduct. On his arrival on the 12th of January 1918, he was taken on strength to the 47th Australian Infantry Battalion and commenced training at the 12th Training Battalion based in Codford on the Salisbury Plain. While there, he would cross paths with a Captain J.E. Mott, who was serving as Brigade Field Officer, a man who would factor quite prominently in his story later on. Initially, Stafford seemed to operate well under the radar, until the end of the month, that is, when he would go on AWL and picked up a military authorities in Belfast four days later. Consequently, he was awarded a forfeiture of eight days' pay in early March. Undeterred, two weeks later, Stafford was awarded four days' forfeiture of pay for talking on parade despite being told to stop, and was such charged with disobeying an order and insolence to an NCO. He then travelled to Dover to board a transport to France on the 1st of April 1918 and entered the number four base depot at Calais. On the 8th, he was taken on strength with the 47th Battalion and as it was recovering following its defensive operations around Dernicourt, to blunt the German Spring Offensive. When he arrived at the unit, it was on the receiving end of a German counter-artillery barrage, as the unit was relocated to the Bazio defensive line on the Somme region, followed by a relocation to La Jose region in northern France the end of April. Following four years of hard fighting and a significant drop in available reinforcements amongst the newly formed Australian Corps, it faced a manpower problem, and the immediate response was to have three brigades disband a battalion in each to use those troops to reinforce the other three. As a result, the 47th, 36th, and 52nd battalions would be chosen and the battalion would be disbanded on the 13th of May. Despite this, the 47th was in and out of the front line up to and including its date of disbandment. And on the 25th, Stafford would be assigned to the Joan of Arc Battalion, 
the 48th Australian Infantry Battalion, which at the time was training in Rivery in the Somme River. Two days later, after joining the 48th on the 27th of May, Stafford was reported AWL. He would be apprehended by military police on the 1st of July and returned to the 48th the following day. By this point, the 48th had relocated to the frontline trenches at Salé Le Sec, as the 48th held the line to the right of the joint Australian-American attack at Hamel, which, according to the unit diary, was able to be observed by the entire battalion from the headquarters, reserve company headquarters, and the front line, though it's unclear if Stafford ever got a chance to see it. After the Battle of Hamel, the 48th was rotated back to Brigade Reserve positions, though companies of the 48th were sent to the front line at Ver er Corby to assist engineers and support operations being conducted by the 48th sister battalions. During this time, Stafford was in confinement, and on the 13th, the 48th Battalion once again moved to a new camp at French Corps, where it was there on the 17th when the unit was undergoing training, that somehow Stafford managed to escape confinement and win AWL once again. He wouldn't be found until the 4th of August, when he was arrested once again at the core reinforcement camp. Unfortunately, his service record for this period was damaged, which means that to reconstruct his movements, I had to rely on the war gratuity summary, which simply lists dates and months and individual actions in one line, which means that for the months of July and August, it's recorded as simply 27th to 5th, 1918, AWL, 1st to 7th, 1918, arrested, 17th to the 7th, 1918, AWL. 1 8 1918, arrested. 19 8 18, AWL, and declared an illegal absentee. Now, this last charge was followed by queries to convene a court of inquiry, which would be held on the 11th of October 1918, which declared Stafford to be illegally absent and still absent. According to Section 7, paragraph 78 of the 1903 Defense Act, quote, any member who absents himself without leave from his corps for a longer period than seven days shall be deemed a deserter and may be punished accordingly, unquote. He would eventually be found by the authorities in Paris on the 7th of November and was marched back to the 48th on the 11th, Armistice Day. Since Stafford had escaped from confinement in July, a court-martial was held on the 9th of December 1918 and he was charged with two counts, escaping confinement and going AWOL from the 19th of August to the 4th of November. He was found guilty of both counts and sentenced to 18 months imprisonment with hard labour plus the remaining 128 days imprisonment he received back in 1916. Somehow, despite this sentence, on the 2nd of January 1919, Percy Stafford once again managed to go AWL, although it would be for the last time. On the 7th of February, he would be once again declared illegally absent by a court of inquiry, but what happens next becomes a little bit controversial. Roughly 11 kilometers from where the 48th Battalion had been billeted from the 25th of February as they awaited demobilization and returned to Australia was the Belgian village of Chaleroy. While there, an officer from the 48th, at the time on leave, thought they recognized Stafford and attempted to detain him. It was then alleged that Stafford, quote, flourished a revolver and escaped, unquote. On his return to camp, the officer informed the authorities of his discovery. Now, do you remember Captain J.E. Mott from the training battalion? Well, the following day, the new commanding officer of the 48th Battalion, Major John Eldred Mott, MC in Bar, ordered his brother, 2nd Lieutenant Herbert William Mott, to take Lieutenant Reginald Roy Shanks, and effect the capture of Stafford. John Elred Mott was the same officer who served in the training battalion in Codford when Stafford was transferred to the Western Front, while Herbert William Mott, his younger brother, was only taken on strength to the 48th on the 12th of February. According to a written statement made by Herbert Mott on the incident in question, written the day it happened, he was given a photograph of Stafford and was informed that he was, quote, a desperate criminal armed with a revolver, unquote. At some point, Stafford was also allegedly implicated in the murder of a Frenchman in Brussels, but that's something I have not been able to independently verify. Now, having read both Herbert Mott's account and the one recorded the 48th Infantry Battalion's unit diary, there are a number of inconsistencies that don't really add up. For one, according to Herbert Mott, Stafford was in a cafe in the middle of a crowded room set up for dancing and occupied by 20 people, including other members of the AIF, members of the British Expeditionary Force, including officers, NCOs, and other ranks, dancing girls, and civilians. The unit diary, however, places him in an disreputable brothel. Herbert Mott, who was a relatively new officer who hadn't yet seen frontline service with the battalion, was acting on the belief that Stafford wouldn't recognize him, and in their search of Chaleroy, decided that he would enter the cafes first to see if Stafford was there, and if so, he would then signal for Shanks, who was waiting outside, to enter and verify his identity. After a break for tea, Mott entered the above-mentioned cafe. Having identified Stafford from the photograph, Mott called for Shanks to enter the cafe and verify his findings. 
Once he was confident that it was Percy Stafford, Mott drew his revolver and ordered Stafford to raise his hands. Shanks and Stafford then exchanged words, though Stafford made no attempt to comply with Mott's repeated instructions. Instead, according to Mott, quote, his hands playing dangerously near the pockets of his British warm, unquote. A British warm is a type of close-fitting long jacket worn by officers and mounted troops, end quote. And had I been alone, I would have shot him several times as his hands went to his pockets, unquote. I feel the need to point out that at this point, there'd been no evidence that Stafford was armed, nor did Mott or Shanks claim to see the aforementioned revolver. In fact, the only reference to Stafford being armed was the claim made by the other officer from the 48th. At this point, Shanks then hands Mott his own revolver and approaches Stafford with the intent of searching him. Mott, according to his own description, attempted to secure the cafe by ordering the closing of the door at the rear of the cafe and instructing the remaining occupants to stay put after a handful had managed to make their escape, including a couple of members of the Australian Imperial Force. He does not mention in his own writings if he did so at the end of the two revolvers like mentioned in the unit diary. At this point, Stafford is apparently, quote, jigging about, unquote. Now, the closest definition of jigging that I've been able to find relevant to this time is dancing, and he was endeavouring to get near a door, quote, presumably either to jump out the door to the front of the cafe and make his escape, or as I now had both revolvers, to close with me. And several times, as I did not wish to shoot if it could possibly be avoided, I warned Lieutenant Shanks to keep him clear of the door or of clear of me as circumstances demanded, which Lieutenant Shanks did, unquote. After this, Mott then apparently asked the remaining patrons of the cafe for a means to restrain Stafford. Then Stafford, apparently realizing the game was up, quote, made a fight for it and with an exclamation closed on Lieutenant Shanks, unquote. The two men grappled to the ground with Stafford straddling Shanks. It wasn't Shanks who threw Stafford to the ground. It is at this point that Mott claims that Stafford went for his revolver, quote, I then, in order to avoid hitting Lieutenant Shanks, sprung across the room and fired in a way which I calculated would not injure Lieutenant Shanks, wounding Stafford, who ceased to struggle, unquote. An officer and men of the 5th Division picket then entered the cafe to inquire about the commotion. Mott identified himself and Shanks as officers of the 48th Battalion, and Shanks had the officer a cocked revolver, allegedly from Stafford's hip pocket. Mott then proceeded to hand over the scene to the picket officer and, not wanting to be recognised further, left Stafford in the care of an ambulance that had arrived to make their quick escape to, quote, make my report to the CO, unquote. It is interesting to note that according to Mott's letter, Percy George Stafford was wounded and ceased struggling and made no reference that he had died or gave any dying words, so it could be close to assume that the exclamation he made to Shanks was, you bastard. Despite these differences, the core elements of the story remains intact. The attempted apprehension of Stafford, his resistance, and the use of force resulting in his death. However, contrary to the statement made by the officer penning the 48th Battalion's unit diary, Percy Stafford did spend most of 1916 and 1917 in the front lines during the Southern Palestine campaign with the Light Horse. And while he spent no time in the line with the 48th, owing to his attention, he did, as far as I've been able to determine, spend some time in the trenches with the 47th. Private Percy George Stafford would be reported killed whilst resisting arrest on the 26th of February, 1919. He was 25. He'd be buried at the nearby Shalleroy Communal Cemetery and would be commemorated in the Penrith City Roll of Honor and the Roll of Honor at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. As a result of his being declared an illegal absentee, he forfeited any service medals or pension. Now, there are a lot of questions that came out of researching this story. Several of them have with serious legal implications attached to them. Questions like why Major Mott ordered his brother to effect the capture of Stafford with the special distinction of bringing him in dead or alive instead of informing the local military police of his location, considering they'd already numerous times successfully captured him. Why were Shanks and Mott ordered to doff their officer distinctions and color patches when all they were supposed to be doing is capturing a deserter? And why didn't they enlist the aid of local forces on their revival instead of aimlessly searching cafes? In fact, when the picket officer approached Shanks and Mott, they had no idea what was going on. Why was Stafford's revolver cocked and loaded in his hip pocket, considering he'd been dancing in the cafe when Mott and Shanks found him? And what actually happened to Stafford after he'd been shot? And how long after was, did the ambulance arrive? Was he still alive when Mott and Shanks were there, and did he die afterwards, or was he killed instantly? However, the most frustrating question of all was why is the account given by Lieutenant Mott to his brother so contextually different to the one recorded in the official unit diary? 
In all honesty, these questions will probably never get answered. Sadly, as an epitaph to this story, the last line in his service record is a postscript, RSW 12366, shot for misconduct equivalent to discharge. Now, I was drawn to Percy's story for two reasons, the way it was conveyed in the unit diary and the fact that I grew up off Stafford Street in Penrith. But the more I read his story, the less I felt that he was a villain who deserved what he got and more of a victim. While he was in Palestine, he would go AWL only when he was near a major population center like Heliopolis, Cairo, and Moscow. The rest of the time, he was doing his job, as far as I can tell. Now, we will never know why he repeatedly went AWL, but he was not alone. Approximately 30,000 Australian soldiers of the 300,000 who were sent overseas also were court-martialed for going AWL or for desertion. Now, the question is, should he have been accepted in the AIF in the first place? Well, who's to say? Should he have been dismissed from the service after that first court-martial? In hindsight, probably. But did he deserve to be shot while resisting arrest mere weeks from the 48th Battalion itself being demobilized? Well, for that one, I'll have to leave you to decide. And there you have it, friends. That is the story of Percy George Stafford. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely came into this episode with a completely different opinion of him than the one I have now. But let me know in the comments what you thought. And remember to get more episodes like this. Check out patreon.com slash IWODMJ. References cited in this episode include Discipline within the AIF on the Western Front by following the 22nd website. The service record of Percy George Stafford from the National Archives of Australia. The Great War 1914-1918 Forum, the official history of Australia's involvement in the Great War of 1914-1918, the New South Wales Department of Births, Deaths and Marriages, the unit diaries of the 1st and 2nd Light Horse Brigades, the 47th and 48th Australian Infantry Battalions, and the 12th Australian Infantry Training Brigade, the Penrith Century Library, and in particular thanks to Stephanie for tracking down a reference they had used in their own telling of Percy Stafford's life that I hadn't been able to find, the online newspaper archive Trove at the National Library of Australia, Character Discipline Law, Courts Martial in the World War I by Yorick Small, and the website and archive of the Australian War Memorial. Thanks for listening to From Duty to Dishonor, an Australian military history podcast. It is a monthly backer-only podcast, unless I decide to share it with the public. So if you like what you heard today and you want to know more, head over to patreon.com slash IWODMJ for more like this and other exclusive content. Now, if you want to continue the conversation or suggest the topic of a future episode, you can also do that on all our social media channels. At this point, Podcast Network is on everything at IWODMJ. If you want to join the Armored Emu Brigade community, you can do so on our Discord server. The invite link to that is in the episode description and on the website, www.network.net. Thanks for listening to From Duty to Dishonor, an Australian military history podcast, a dot .network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This podcast is mostly a one-man show, with me doing the writing, researching, recording, audio engineering, and directing, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker, and do not represent the opinions or views of any agency, entity, or organization. Intro and outro themes by Pavel Burakov of Pixabay. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. Until next time, friends, catch you then. Bye.